This last bit is a summary of thermochemistry terms. There was a time when I worked in industry, and one of my main goals was making butyl acrylate, which is used in paint coatings. This involves taking acrylic acid and butanol to make butyl acrylate and water. For the most part, the enthalpy change of this reaction is zero, and the entropy change is also close to zero. So what would you do to maximize the butyl acrylate and not waste the acrylic acid and the butanol? The first thing to do is add a catalyst. That doesn't necessarily help with making more product, but it does save money because the reactor does not need to be heated as hot. Another thing to do is drive the reaction forward by adding additional reactant. Our ratio for AA and butanol is 1 to 1, according to the reaction stoichiometry. But if we add 40% more butanol, we can push this reaction to the right. Butanol is, of course, the less expensive reagent. Another thing we can do is pull the reaction forward by removing product. This reactor distilled the butyl acrylate and water into a different container. Butyl acrylate and water do not mix. The butyl acrylate floats on top. So we had a drain in this reactor chamber to drain away the water and by doing that, drive the reaction forward. So this is Le Chatelier's at work. We load with one reactant and draw off the product. Left on its own, this reaction makes about 50% product. By pushing with Le Chatelier's, we were able to make 99.999% of our materials into butyl acrylate with a continuous feed reactor. Notice, though, that we had to put energy into the system to make this happen. We had to waste by having extra butanol, and we had to put in mechanisms to draw off the water. As a reminder on thermochemistry, this is our main formula. Delta G naught is equal to delta H naught for the system minus T delta S naught for the system. How do we know the values of delta H naught? Well, we can look at bonds broken minus bonds formed, or we can use our knowledge of the relative energies of solid, liquid, and gas when we are studying phase transitions. How can we figure out delta S naught? We can look at a reaction and figure out gas out minus gas in. Or, if it's a phase change, we can look at our knowledge of relative level of disorder for solid, liquid, or gas. When delta G naught is negative, the reaction is extensive and prefers product. When delta G naught is positive, the reaction is not extensive and prefers to remain at reactant. If we know delta G naught and the temperature, we know KEQ. This is actually the formula. There is a relationship between delta G naught and the equilibrium constant. And if we know KEQ and the concentration of products and reactants, we can figure out the sign of delta G under our specific conditions and know whether a reaction will be spontaneous or not. So here is the chemist's job, which sometimes you might have to do. I've definitely worked in companies where engineers had to do the job of chemists, and sometimes I had to do the job of an engineer. I now know how to calculate Reynolds numbers. First job, will this reaction work? Uh, you have three quarters of a chance it will. You can either have minus plus, minus minus at low temp, or plus plus at high temp. You've got a shot. Why doesn't this reaction work? Maybe it's a minus minus and your temperature is too high. Maybe it's a plus plus and your temperature is too low. That seems to be the first thing a chemist will do, change the temperature. Will this reaction produce a 100% product? Mm, not usually. 
How can I make this lousy reaction produce 100% pure product? Well, we're going to have to employ Le Chatelier's. We should load one of the reactants with extra amount and take away the product as it's formed. How could I make this reaction go faster and waste less reactor energy? A catalyst would be a good idea. I used to work in the polymer industry, so we actually had to worry about making our reactions go slower so it didn't get so hot it blew up the reactor and ignited the solvent. The opposite of a catalyst is an inhibitor. I made 10 grams of this. Now I want to make 10,000 pounds. How can I do this safely? Well, if the reaction with 10 grams in your flask raises the temperature by 1 degree Celsius, what do you think it will do with 10,000 pounds? Often we have to heat up reactors to get to a temperature where the reaction proceeds at a reasonable rate, but often that temperature has to be controlled to make sure it doesn't run away. In our Gibbs free energy equation, delta H controls activities at low temperature, minus T delta S controls activities at high temperature. Mother Nature's goal is for all things to go to the lowest free energy, so stuff happens when delta G is negative. What are Mother Nature's happy signs? When delta H is negative, so the system loses heat at constant pressure, an exothermic reaction is preferred. Or when delta S is positive, so the system spreads out energy among multiple states. What reactions is Mother Nature not so fond of? When delta H is positive, so the system gains heat at constant pressure and is endothermic. Or delta S is negative, which means the system concentrates energy into fewer states. The system becomes more ordered as the reaction proceeds. How do you figure out delta H and delta S? For reactions, which means covalent or ionic bonds are broken and formed. We know if the reaction feels hot, it's exothermic. We know if the reaction feels cold to the touch, it's endothermic. For delta S, if we see gas out, like perhaps bubbles, then delta S is positive. If we're in a closed container and the pressure drops, we know that delta S must be negative because less gas is being produced. If we don't know from observation, sometimes we can figure out the sign by mathematical necessity. We know that for an endothermic reaction in which delta H is positive, in order for that reaction to happen, delta S must also be positive. On the other end of mathematical necessity, for a reaction that concentrates energy to happen, it must be exothermic. If delta S is negative, which means it concentrates energy, this entire term will be positive. The only way for the reaction to happen is if delta H is negative. That is the only way we can add things to get a negative value. For phase changes, don't forget your lovely potential energy, and disorder diagrams, which have solid low and gas at a high level. Going up, both are positive. Going down, both are negative. Here is a reminder of our reaction coordinate diagram summary. We can have reactions that go uphill from reactant to product, so delta G naught is positive, energy of activation forward is greater than energy of activation reverse, and rate constant forward is less than rate constant reverse. At equilibrium, this reaction will prefer reactant, so it is non-extensive, and K will be less than 1. When free energy change at standard state is 0, this reaction will settle at 50-50. K is equal to 1. 
when delta G naught is less than zero, we know that energy of activation forward is less than energy of activation reverse. The rate constant forward is greater than the rate constant reverse. At equilibrium, this will settle more materials into product. So it is extensive, and K is greater than 1. And finally, a reaction composition diagram summary. This one you have already seen. This would be for a reaction in which delta G naught is negative, which means that it likes to go forward more often than in reverse. And when it settles at equilibrium, it will be closer to the product side than the reactant side, and K will be greater than 1. The opposite scenario is going uphill, so delta G naught is greater than zero. This will be a non-extensive reaction. And most of the time, if we try to go forward, most of this is uphill. So delta G will be non-spontaneous. It settles at equilibrium more toward the reactant side, so K will be less than one. Thermodynamics is a funny subject. The first time you go through it, you don't understand it at all. The second time you go through it, you think you understand it, except for one or two small points. The third time you go through it, you know you don't understand it. But by that time you are so used to it, it doesn't bother you anymore. I hope you feel that you've come a long way in studying thermodynamics over the last few lectures. Remember that you need to go over thermodynamics at least three times so it doesn't bother you anymore.